Voice of Truth presented by Church of Christ Hello viewers we welcome you to this Voice of Truth program we encourage you to join with us for a in depth bible study our today's lesson will be delivered by brother jd bates of world evangelism also the associate editor of the Voice of Truth international magazine come let us hear the word of god thank you for joining us today and we certainly hope that these lessons will be beneficial to you in your spiritual growth. Today, for just a few moments, I want to consider the idea that we have a temple of God. Now, we're all familiar with temples. We know that the ancient world had many temples dedicated to the various pagan gods. We also know that the, the people of Judaism had a temple. That temple, of course, was a physical building that was built there in Jerusalem. It was considered to be the dwelling place of God. It was their place of worship and was considered to be a holy place. The Jews revered this temple very highly, and they looked upon that temple as the center of Judaism all over the world. In the meantime, we as Christians think that we do not have a temple. Well, we do not have a physical building like a temple such as Jew did in Jerusalem, but we do have a temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for example, in verse 16 and 17, we find Paul saying these words, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So twice in these verses, Paul said that we are the temple of God. So we do have a temple, but our temple is ourselves. God is dwelling within us in a spiritual sense. Obviously, it's not a physical building, but it is a temple, and God is dwelling in us. Now, since God is dwelling in us spiritually, and our bodies is considered to be the temple of God, then that means we can draw some comparison between our bodies and the temple of God revealed to us in the Old Testament. First of all, it points out that as the temple of God, that means God is dwelling in us. The church is our spiritual house. Now, as our the spiritual house has to be built upon a foundation, then that foundation is Jesus Christ. All physical buildings have to have a foundation. All spiritual buildings have to have a foundation as well. But our spiritual building, our bodies, is built upon the Jesus Christ as the foundation. In chapter 3, in verse 11, there Paul said, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So Jesus is our foundation of the church. Paul laid the foundation when he preached the gospel of Christ to the people there in Corinth. And since Paul laid the foundation, then that precludes any other Christian workers from laying another foundation or preaching another gospel. This is very similar to the idea that Paul presented in Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, when he said, Though we are an e even an angel of heaven to preach any other gospel unto you than that what you have received, let him be accursed. And he repeats the same thing in the very next verse, showing he wants to emphasize that fact, that we must only preach the gospel of Christ. We must only preach the gospel that Paul preached, because he was the inspired apostle, of the gospel of Christ. You see, the Christ gospel is the foundation of this temple. And if we must lay a strong foundation, and you cannot lay a stronger foundation than that which is Jesus. But also we must take care about how we build on this foundation. We can build a man-centered religion, or we can build a God-centered religion. We must obviously make sure that we're building a God-centered religion. Since the foundation is built upon Jesus, then the gospel of Christ must be how we build our house. The Corinthians were guilty of building on the wrong foundation, and it was doomed to failure. Since it's God's house, we must be careful how we build on this foundation. Now, as the church is the temple of God, and we know in the Old Testament that the, the temple was the meeting place of God and his people. Well, the same thing is true today. Here we find the church is considered to be the temple of God. 
We as members of the church then are the temples of God. God is dwelling in us. God is dwelling in church in a spiritual sense. Now, since the church is the meeting place of God, then obviously that means we must be in the church in order to meet with God. For the Jews, if they wanted to worship God correctly, they had to go to the temple there in Jerusalem because that was the dwelling place of God. That was the meeting place. That was a place that God said, I will meet with you in worship. Since the church is the temple, then God has chosen the church as his meeting place with his people. That means then that we must be in the church. You know, we have so many people today denigrate the idea of the church. Many would try to say, oh, I'm very religious. I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to have anything to do with the church. I just want Jesus. I do not want the church. Now, of course, what the church they're thinking about is the physical buildings and the religious organizations that we often find in the world today. We do not need those things, but we must have the church because the church that we read about in the New Testament is the meeting place of God and his people. If we're not in the church, then we cannot meet with God because we're trying to meet with God in the wrong place. So we must be in the church. Well, obviously the idea is, well, how do we get into the church then? Well, again, many people have the wrong idea. Many people think that you might be voted into the church or that you just simply choose to join the church or some other ways to get into the church. But let's not worry about what man says. Let's look at what the Bible says. You see, the Bible tells us exactly how we get into the church that we read about in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, there we find Paul saying, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Notice Paul said that we're baptized into the one body. The one body is the church. There is only one church. Just as Jesus only had one body, so Christ only has one church. And there this passage tells us that we're baptized into that one body. We are baptized into Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, for example, there Paul points out the fact that we're baptized into Jesus Christ. He said, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him in baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice again, Paul said that we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Now, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death, we're baptized into his body, which is the church. Thus again, we find a teaching that we're baptized into the church that we read about in the Bible. As the believing penitent sinner is baptized into Christ, we are united with God and united with Christ. And since we are members of the church, members of Christ's body, then we can meet with God because the church, again, is the meeting place of God. That makes the church very important, doesn't it? Because the church is God's meeting place with his people. If we do not, if we are not members of the church, then we cannot really meet with God because God has specified that God will meet with his people in the temple the church, as we read about in the New Testament. Remember, God met with the Jews in the Old Testament temple, the temple there in Jerusalem. Well, today we don't have a physical temple or a physical building. We are members of the church. The church is said to be God's meeting place with his people. That makes the church very important, doesn't it? It also means that we must be members of that church because if we're not members of the church, and we cannot meet with God. We're trying to meet with God in the wrong place. And that will not work, of course. So we need to make sure we're members of that church. We get into the church again by being buried with him in baptism for the remission of our sins. 
when we do that, then God adds us to his body. God adds us to his church. And then we can meet with God and worship him on a regular basis. And we know that we have the assurance of God's care and concern for us as we go through our daily lives. Now, the next time we meet together, we hope to discuss a little more about this, the church being the temple of God. But after that's sufficient for today. And so I will let you go now, and we certainly hope to see you again. Thank you. Dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you to this Voice of Truth study series. We are going through why we believe and what we believe. Today, our topic would be why we believe in unity. When we study about unity, we have to consider few things. There is unity between God, Christ and Holy Spirit. There is unity in scriptures. There is unity among believers, that is the church. There is unity in Christian life between man and the Lord. Unity is being able to agree, to cooperate and to work together. Why we believe in unity? Point number one, because the opposite of unity is division. In Romans chapter 16 verse 17 and 18 we read, Now I beseech you brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 through 13, where Paul condemns those who are creating divisions in the name of Paul, Apollos, Cephas and Christ. Apostle Paul questions them who was crucified for them. Was it Paul, Apollos or Peter? He tells them it was Jesus Christ and Christ is not divided. So, they cannot be in divisions. Further, Lord is not pleased with division, but rather he opposes it and condemns it. Point number two. Division is condemned while unity is encouraged. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Point number 3. Lord Jesus Christ prayed for unity. We can read in John chapter 17 verse 20 through 23. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Maybe one as thou, Father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them me. We can see here that Christ was praying for the unity of the believers, and be united as one. Point number four. Christians have basis for unity. When we read in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 through 6, Apostle Paul clearly explains why Christians have to remain united. We read that with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, Enduring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So Paul here clearly explains, everything is one, 
So, how can we be divided? Psalmist David clearly reveals the joy of being one. In Psalms 133 verse 1, we read, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Dear brothers and sisters, let us be united as one in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for your patient listening. Goodbye till we meet again. May God bless you all. It is God's will that you must be saved. First listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15. Ars Radi Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu For more details dial 9244204420 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you Joy Creative Production For video coverage and editing audio recording and editing promo for advertisement graphic design contact 9042494996